Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Joanne Constantine, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan Medical School, Pediatrics Department, Child Health Evaluation and Research Center. Tops is organized by Mike Pascoe at University of Missouri, C. Chang at The Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pause questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards even if they are not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and, and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TUPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's, to today's moderator, Mike Pasco from University of Missouri to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our summer 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Hunchul Kim from Sung Kwan Wan University entitled Tax Incidents for Menthol Cigarettes by Race, Evidence from Nielsen Home Scan Data. Hunchul Kim is an Associate Professor of Economics at Sung Kwan Wan University. Prior to joining Sung Kwan Wan University, he worked at Amazon.com. He completed a BA in economics at Seoul National University and a PhD in economics at the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on various topics in industrial organization and applied microeconomics, including differentiated products, demand, consumer choice and firm behavior, production function and firm productivity, antitrust economics, tax incidence, and minimum wage. Our discussant today is Dr. Dean Lillard, an economist and professor at the Ohio State University. Dr. Hunchul Kim, thank you for presenting for us today. Uh, thank you for the information, uh, invitation and having uh, me today. So let me start my presentation uh, straight away. So title of the paper I present today is uh, Tax Incidents for Mental Cigarettes by Race. Evidence from Nielsen Home Scan Data. And this paper was recently published at the Journal of Health Economics. So here's a disclosure of the funding source and disclaimer regarding the data that we use. So this research is supported by the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Korea and the National Research Foundation of Korea. So these two funding sources are my for my co-author, uh, and we have not received any tobacco-related funding over the past 10 years. The data that uh, we use in our uh, paper are provided by the Nielsen IQ dataset at the KILT Center for Marketing Data, uh, which is at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. So conclusions here are the author's own and do not reflect the views of the data provider. All right, so here's the outline of my uh, talk today. So I will uh, first give some motivations and uh, introductory uh, discussion. And then I will briefly explain why tax instance on mental cigarettes may uh, differ by race. And then I will proceed uh, with my empirical uh, analysis. All right, so here's a uh, motivation. So statistics that have been uh, showing that uh, African-American smokers have the highest percentage of mental cigarette use. So specifically, 70, uh, about 77% of black smokers uh, use mental product, whereas only 25% of white smokers uh, use mental product. So these uh, numbers may uh, differ depending on which sample year to, we use, but uh, they are mostly similar and especially the countries between black and uh, white uh, smokers uh, has remained uh, similar for many years. So there are some distinctive features about a mental product. Uh, 
specifically menthol creates a cooling and uh, anesthetic effect, and this masks the harshness of uh, smoke. And some studies have been arguing that uh, these features uh, have some consequences in smoking behavior. So for example, menthol smokers uh, inhale more deeply and they hold uh, the smoke uh, longer in their lungs and uh, they show a higher level of nicotine addiction. However, the finding about these uh, arguments uh, have been uh, mixed and inconclusive in the literature. Uh, another noticeable and important fact is that uh, Blacks have the highest mortality rate for lung cancer and other smoking-related diseases, although they have similar smoking rate as whites. So the smoking rates of both whites and uh, African-Americans uh, are around uh, 16 to 17 percent uh, based on the uh, 2015 uh, data. So given the harmfulness of a menthol product, uh, though it's still debatable in the literature, and given the high percentage of uh, menthol cigarette use among uh, Blacks, racial disparities in menthol cigarette use are part of the reasons for the recent proposal to ban uh, menthol cigarettes in the United States. So this uh, policy, uh, there has been a long debate uh, around this policy. Uh, and some of, some of this goes like this. The opponents of this policy uh, have been arguing that uh, banning menthol cigarettes may have uh, some negative effect. So for example, uh, it will reduce tax revenues and uh, it can increase uh, criminaliza criminalization uh, because of uh, cigarette smuggling, and it can also result in uh, uh, aggressive policing in black communities. And uh, people who agree to the banning policy uh, argue that uh, banning has a potential for decreasing youth smoking initiation, but the opponents say that uh, th th this argument is uh, not very convincing, given the fact that the smoking rate is only around 1% for both Black and non-Black youth groups. And the smoking rate of youth group of 1% is based on uh, 2018 and 2020 survey. Uh, so a more conventional and traditional method of uh, reducing menthol cigarette smoking is to increase cigarette taxes. So if black menthol smokers are price sensitive at all, uh, in other words, uh, if they are not perfectly inelastic, then increasing taxes would effectively reduce menthol cigarette use among uh, blacks. Here, the effectiveness of a taxes to reduce black menthol smoking depend, uh, will depend on the, uh, the extent to which taxes are shifted to prices paid by black menthol smokers. So uh, this is going to be the primary focus of, of our uh, paper. So here's uh, what we do in this paper. Uh, we empirically examine uh, whether the incidence of a cigarette taxes on uh, menthol product uh, varies with race uh, of smokers. So to do this, we use a uh, very detailed information. Uh, so very detailed household level and product level information uh, of uh, the cigarette uh, purchases uh, collected by Nielsen Home Scan data. And using this data set, we uh, estimate the rate at which cigarette excise taxes are shifted to consumer prices uh, across race and uh, product types. So the Nielsen home scan data are uh, ideal for our uh, research uh, because they provide uh, very rich information about uh, product type and uh, demographic characteristics of, the, of cigarette buyers. So specifically the data uh, contain the following information. Uh, the data have uh, consumer prices at the universal product code, so-called UPC level, uh, paid by uh, uh, around 31,000 households across uh, 48 uh, state and uh, DC. And the data also provide 
the you know information information about uh, the cigarette buyers say the identity such as race and income and also the location of uh, consumers at the five digit zip code level and also the type of uh, product they purchase So here's the preview of our uh, findings. So first we find that uh, taxes are shifted at significantly lower rate to black buyers of menthol cigarettes than any other ethnic groups. Specifically, $1 increase in state cigarette excise taxes uh, result in $1 increase in menthol cigarette prices for white buyers. Uh, and this is a uh, full shifting. Uh, however, uh, $1 increase in cigarette taxes uh, lead to only 68 increase in prices uh, paid by black buyers. So our conjecture about uh, the potential explanation about this result is that uh, black menthol smokers may be more responsive to uh, cigarette prices than other uh, ethnic groups. So this is somewhat consistent with uh, with what happens on the supply side. Uh, so we see that uh, tobacco industry has long targeted uh, blacks for the sale of menthol cigarettes. So for example, they have been providing uh, lots of free samples and price discount, and also they sponsored the special event uh, associated uh, with a menthol product uh, like uh, this. Uh, this is one example, jazz festival. Uh, which basically, uh, you know, advertise uh, a certain brand of mental product. Uh, and also, uh, this uh, racial difference in path-through rates for mental product is uh, more significant in areas with a large uh, black population. So this is, you know, what we also find. And uh, lastly, we also find uh, that uh, black smokers receive a significantly more price discount for menthol product than white menthol buyers. So this finding uh, indirectly support the potential explanation uh, I mentioned above uh, that uh, black menthol smokers may be uh, more responsive to cigarette prices. All right. So uh, here's the uh, related studies, but uh, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I like to mention that uh, there are only a few studies uh, that have been, uh, that have examined the incidence of uh, cigarette excise taxes by race or uh, product type like uh, menthol and non-menthol. All right. So now I'm going to briefly explain why tax incidence for menthol smokers may differ by race. So as we all know, the general principle of tax shifting is that uh, taxes are shifted away from economic agent, whether they are uh, consumers or suppliers, who are most able to change their behavior in response to uh, taxation. So given this, uh, the complexity in the analysis of tax shifting or in the interpretation of uh, empirical result uh, comes from the fact that the observed uh, tax path-through is an equilibrium outcome, uh, which results from the interaction between uh, demand and supply-side behaviors. So first, here's the story on the demand side. As taxes will be shifted away from consumers with uh, more price elastic demand. Uh, but the thing is, uh, in the context of our analysis, uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, there exists only insufficient evidence uh, about the price elasticity of demand for menthol cigarettes or for uh, specific uh, ethnic groups. So. I think this is still an unanswered or uh, incompletely answered research question. And I believe that this is certainly a venue for future research. And the story on the supply side goes like this. If black smokers are more price sensitive for uh, uh, whatever reason, 
then manufacturers and retailers can increase profits by targeting price promotions to black menthol smokers and shifting uh, taxes to the prices paid by other smokers. So this is more about the uh, strategic pricing decision, which is to uh, charge uh, different prices depending on the customer's willingness to pay or price elasticity. And we call this uh, price discrimination. And indeed, uh, we often see that price promotions are uh, more common or more widely available in uh, black communities. All right, so let me uh, explain about the data set we use. Uh, we use the Nielsen Home Scan uh, panel data uh, for the sample period spanning from 2008 to 2014. And the data contain 1.6 million transactions uh, made by uh, 31,000 households uh, over 48 state and uh, Washington DC. And uh, household who participate in uh, Nielsen Home Scan panel, uh, they are given in-home scanning device and they scan uh, using this device, they scan the barcode of the product they purchase from retail outlets. And uh, retail out the type of retail outlets um, uh, covered by this data set is pretty comprehensive, including super centers, grocery stores, drug stores, club stores, and other uh, independent stores uh, like uh, convenience store and gas station. So the scanner record uh, product at the UPC level. So UPC representing uh, universal product code, uh, which is a unique uh, code for uh, product, uh, you know, over, you know, all kinds of retail stores. So they share this UPC. So a UPC distinguishes each product by uh, detailed product attributes uh, like a brand, uh, package size, package type, and flavor. So for example, Marlboro Menthol 100 millimeter soft pack is a single UPC. So the data contain uh, about 4,600 UPCs, uh, which uh, cover uh, about 300 brands. So the participating household enter the price and quantity of each of their purchases uh, every week. Uh, and the data also contain uh, demo uh, information about demographic characteristics of the participating household. Uh, and they include uh, household size, uh, income level, and age, uh, number of uh, children, age of children, and education level, and employment status, and most importantly, uh, ethnicity. So the observation unit uh, in for our uh, uh, estimation model is a uh, monthly average price paid by a household for each UPC. So I'm gonna get to a little more details about uh, this when I explain the empirical setup. So here's a table of a summary statistics of the variables uh, we use. So the uh, sample mean of uh, consumer uh, price per pack in dollar is 4.63. And uh, uh, mean of excise tax uh, also in dollar is 1.22. And the proportion of a mental product um, is about uh, 35%. And uh, transactions of, uh, you know, transactions, carton purchases, carton purchases are about 33% uh, in our data set and uh, purchases of a genetic brand as opposed to premium brands are uh, about uh, 36%. So we also have a demographic characteristic, uh, demographic variables, but, I, uh, but uh, they are omitted. Uh, all right, the second, the next table is, uh, it present purchasing patterns of a mental product uh, by race. So I first uh, calculated the share of mental purchase, uh, so which is the ratio of uh, mental purchases in pack uh, to the total number of cigarette packs uh, purchased. 
So we can see that the share of mentor purchase is the highest for a black household, which is 74%, uh, whereas it's uh, 30 for whites and 37 for other uh, ethnic groups. And I also construct the indicator of a mentor smoker where I uh, define mentor smoker as a household uh, uh, whose purchases are uh, at least 50% uh, uh, mentor product. So, uh, so numbers are pretty similar. Uh, so 74% uh, of black household are mentor smokers whereas only 30% uh, of a white uh, household are uh, mentor smokers and 37% for uh, other ethnic groups. All right, so let me pause here and get uh, some questions uh, answered. Okay, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation so far. Um, audience members, if you have any questions, uh, please enter these into the Q&A panel. Um, but first, I'll turn it over to our discussant today, Dean Luller, to see if he has any questions or comments. Um, hi, thanks very much. And and uh, this is a very interesting paper. Anybody in the audience who's interested in this topic, I highly recommend that you read the paper. Careful analysis. Uh, it's very enjoyable. And I want to make first a really broad comment about the people who use the Nielsen Home Scan data. That's an important rather technical point for everyone to, to take in, into account. What we're interested in is we're interested in, in individuals' responsiveness to taxes. We want to know how much they find ways to get out from underneath the taxes. But the Nielsen data is measured at the household level, and that needs to be brought out much more. Not obviously in this paper, it's already published, but going forward, there's an attenuation in what we're able to estimate when we use the Nielsen data, because what we observe is purchases of the household. It's not individual elasticities of demand. And so there's ways that you can try and get around that, but it's actually quite important for the policy objective. The second thing is really a comment on Jewel, and you can respond to it if you like. Um, and that is that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you can't conflate not using menthol products and quitting cigarettes because they aren't the same thing. The assumption that's sort of built into the way that it's presented in the paper is that if uh, Blacks face higher uh, taxes and they uh, don't have to, or they don't end up paying as much, it means they're substituting away but they could be substituting to other cigarettes that are non-mentholated. And that's a very important point to make from a public health perspective. You've got ways to test that. And it's not simply using a, a UPC fixed effect. You can test it directly, uh, whether somebody who's previously smoking menthol mentholated cigarettes is switching. So you have to estimate a switching model. Uh, and I think that that's actually very important because when you think about how do people substitute, they substitute from either quitting, switch, switching to another cigarette. And a third thing that I just want to point out, and it's something that you mentioned in the paper, and that is going off the into the black market. And it, this is an important point because some of the top 10 counties in terms of the percentage of the population that's black are located in places like Chicago and New York, where there's a lot of cross-border smuggling. And it's not simply a private consumer driving over to Indiana from the south side of Chicago and buying cigarettes. I dealt with the tax, excise tax director of, of the city of Chicago. There is a huge supply of smuggled cig cigarettes, you know, from the work of Merriman who looked at littered cigarettes. And that's not happening because people are going across as individuals and buying cigarettes. It's because people are bringing truckloads of cigarettes into the city, which are probably not, I don't know this, but I would suspect they're not registered on the um, Nielsen data. These are sold under the counter. Uh, and, and so it's something to consider and to try and explore a little bit. Okay, so I'll stop there and we'll go on and, and I'll make more comments. Those are all comments, sorry, <laughs> no questions. <laughs> uh, thanks for the comment, uh, uh, Professor Lillard. 
So uh, oh, may I answer you. you? Oh, yeah, go ahead. That sounds great. All right. So for the first questions, yes, uh, you're correct. So this is uh, purchase information. So this is not exactly elasticity. So uh, we're very careful about, uh, you know, discussing about the elasticity. So, you know, in, in, in fact, you know, I'm working on a new project that, you know, where I can, you know, uh, uh, back out the price elasticity from uh, detailed purchase information. So uh, that's my answer to the first question. And the second question, uh, that's pretty important, right? Uh, so quitting and switching, this is way different. So, you know, but if I, you know, carefully take advantage of my you know, micro level uh, data, then I can clearly, I can certainly uh, examine the switching behavior you know, whether, you know, which product they switch to, but quitting, that's, I think, uh, beyond the scope of the uh, research question. But uh, maybe if they stop purchasing mentor product or, you know, stop purchasing any sort of uh, 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 a brand or a cigarette product, then I can probably define that as quitting, but that's a little tricky, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, all right. And the third question, uh, yes, that's also important, very important. Uh, but smuggling, any information about smuggling, that's pretty hard. So the only thing I can, you know, examine, I mean, based on the previous literature is, you know, to somehow investigate the cross-state tax avoidance. So that's possible. But like you mentioned, that's probably a very small portion uh, of tax avoidance. So smuggling is important, but I'm not very sure if we have any access to any sort of uh, that information, but if that's possible, then, you know, we can merge in that information in our uh, analysis. Yeah. Okay, I think, thank, thank you. Um, um, for your, um, and this feeds into some of the audience uh, questions, um, but um, uh, for the, the idea of quitting that you were just mentioning, you might want to think about, um, mentholated cigars as well, right? And, and um, I mean, the cigar marketplace, I know that um, uh, African-Americans disproportionately use cigars, right? I think that's something that you can observe in the home scan mm -hmm. data. Um, so it might be interesting to look at some substitution between cigarette cigars and and right. for your, your tobacco abstinence measure include not just cigarette products, but a broader array of different, different products. Um, right. But there's actually quite a few questions about the, the Nielsen home scan data. So how about we get those out of the way first? Um, uh, somebody asks if it includes e-cigarette purchases, and they made the point, kind of like cigars, I guess, that um, uh, people might switch to mint-flavored e-cigarettes. Um, um, and then also there's some questions about um, uh, what are the incentives provided for the sample population to respond to the Nielsen home scan um, uh, uh, data? Um, are these incentives large enough that we think they're actually scanning all of their products? And I guess that kind of gets to... Dr. Lillard's point about black market products and if those can even possibly be scanned in the in the the data. So I don't know if you could shed more light on this data collection effort along those lines. So for the first questions, uh, yes, it I think it's possible that you know people switch to menthol e-cigarette, but you know in our analysis we exclude uh, you know any product like e-cigarettes. So probably that's a limitation of our research, but yeah, that's, you know, one thing that we can consider because, you know, the Nielsen home scan data also cover the e-cigarette product. And the second question, uh, uh, you know, the way they scan the product is they, you know, some of the retailers ha have a contract with the Nielsen company. So, you know, if the household, the participating household, the panelists the scan the receipt, then the the information is all delivered to the Nielsen company uh, pretty conveniently. But uh, you know, any other uh, stores like independent stores, they are not contracting with the Nielsen company, so they have to scan their receipt one by one, item by item, and then, but. Uh, I think they are monitoring their, uh, uh, their, uh, uh, um, you know, scanning uh, uh, patterns. So I think the information is uh, quite uh, accurate. But uh, other than that, the smuggled product or any sort of that product like that, th those are not, you know, included in our data set. Okay. 
And do you know anything about the incentive to for participants to participate with oh, Nielsen? Yeah. Uh, so uh, to my knowledge, they are randomly picked, and then they once they participate in the as a panelist, they are rewarded some sort of some kind of a coupons, which is not specific to certain retailers, and. Uh, I think, and Nielsen also admit that there might be some sampling bias, but they provide the sampling project or uh, sampling weight. So in all of my analysis, I use the uh, uh, sampling weights to best uh, represent the population. Um, and uh, is, do you have an exact definition of what is a menthol cigarette? Um, the reviewer mentions, we understand the practicality um, all brands contain some menthol. So how much menthol makes a cigarette menthol? Uh, uh, it... Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, I have the, the Nielsen provides some information about uh, product name and brand name. So from that, I, you know, extract, you know, any word uh, which uh, is associated menthol. And then, you know, I mark them as menthol product define them. So that's what, how I construct the uh, mentholated product. Okay, thank you. Um, please continue with your presentation. All right. So here's the empirical uh, model. So uh, we use a regression-based empirical model to estimate tax instance. And this model follows uh, previous studies that estimate tax instance using micro-level data. So the dependent variable PIJST is price per pack for UPCI paid by household J in state S in month T. And the uh, regressors on the right-hand side include uh, tau ST, which is a state cigarette excise tax per pack in state S in time T and uh, xj which is a vector of a household demographic characteristics and also i include uh, a fixed effect uh, so first uh, delta i is upc fixed effect and mu s is a state fixed effect and delta t is a time fixed effect for year and months uh, separately so the key parameter here is beta one uh, which is a coefficient for uh, tau st state excise tax so if beta one is one, then that implies full shifting of taxes to consumer prices. So state already excise taxes increased at least once in 23 states in the sample period of 2008 to 2014. And the average tax increase is 96 cent per pack. So I think there is sufficient variation uh, in uh, excise taxes in my data set. All right, so here's the identification uh, strategies. So first, uh, we include uh, multiple layers of a fixed effect, uh, taking advantage of our using uh, micro-level data. So first, uh, UPC fixed effect uh, allow us to compare within product variation in prices. And this is quite important because this uh, UPC fixed effect allow us not to worry about the possibility that consumers alter uh, product choices when excise taxes increase. So it's well documented in the literature that uh, when uh, consumers are faced by a tax increase, uh, they may upgrade or downgrade the quality of a cigarettes for different uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, using UPC fixed effect avoid uh, you know the, the bias uh, that came that can come from uh, this uh, upgrade uh, uh, no sorry so product switching and second we stay uh, uh, we use state fixed effect uh, in order to control for uh, time invariant unobservable characteristics uh, that might be correlated with both tax levels and the increase in cigarette prices. So for example, if there is uh, a strong anti-smoking sentiment in a state or the other way around, then uh, they, might, uh, uh, they might be relate, uh, correlated with the tax level as well as the uh, uh, cigarette prices. So we control for this factor. And 
our identification strategy is basically uh, the DID type of estimation where the treatment uh, group is the set of states in which uh, cigarette taxes increase. And the control group is the set of states without the tax changes. So uh, beta one, the parameter for parameter of tax incidence is identified by uh, comparing the within UPC change in prices among uh, 23 treaty states with tax changes uh, over the sample period relative to uh, control, control state that uh, did not change the tax changes holding household characteristics constant. So we need the same old uh, identifying assumption of a parallel uh, trend assumption. So this assumption implies that uh, price trends in both treated and controlled states would be the same absent the tax increase, conditioning on the fixed effect and other uh, control variables. So to examine whether this uh, assumption is reasonable for our data, we uh, performed a simple uh, empirical exercise of a, an event study type of regression. Mm -hmm. So what we did here is we regress uh, consumer prices on uh, the dummy variables for uh, 10 weeks before and after the uh, tax change. So the coefficient for the uh, coefficient for the dummy variables represent uh, prices of a tri treaty states relative to prices paid in state without uh, tax changes over the sample period. So the red dots here, are the coefficient estimate for the dummy variable for the pre-tax change uh, weeks. So we can see that they are, uh, they, are they remain pretty similar before tax change, uh, like a plateau. So the results here, the graph here shows that there is a little evidence of differential pre-tax change price trends. So in other words, tax change is not endogenous with respect to uh, underlying price trends. So we uh, presume that the parallel assumption uh, is reasonable here. All right, so here's a baseline result. So we the regression model is run for uh, each ethnic group, but uh, not yet uh, separately by uh, product type. So coefficient for uh, excise tax uh, captures the rate of tax shifting. Uh, so this is beta one. So first of all, all uh, ethnic groups, taxes are less than fully shifted to consumer prices. So we can uh, check that by uh, testing this null hypothesis that beta one is one, and then this null hypothesis is rejected uh, for all ethnic groups. Uh, so more importantly, if we take a look at uh, column two, three, four, then taxes are, we can see that taxes are shifted at lower rate to prices paid by blacks than whites or other ethnic groups. Uh, however, uh, we should note here that the average rate of tax shifting by race uh, we estimate here, uh, it masks substantial differences across uh, product types like uh, mental and non-mental. So what we do next is that uh, we estimate the regression model separately for each product type. So this is the main result. Uh, so the, the regression model is now uh, estimated separately for mental and non-mental product, uh, as well as separately for uh, each ethnic group. So key finding here is that, uh, so panel A is mental product and panel B is non-mental product. And the key finding uh, is that the difference in tax incidence for mental cigarettes between blacks and white is significantly large. So the rate at which excise taxes are shifted to uh, mental cigarette prices is uh, 68 cents for black buyers, uh, but it's uh, full shifting for uh, white buyers. Uh, in contrast, this pattern does not emerge for non-mental product. So the direction of difference in tax instance between black and white smokers is reversed uh, for non-mental product. 
So the result here uh, indicate that the lower average rate of shifting for blacks, uh, which we have seen uh, in the previous slide, uh, uh, relative to white or other ethnic groups, uh, this is uh, mainly attributable to menthol cigarettes. So here's a little more implications of our res our result. Uh, we have seen that uh, tax instance for menthol cigarette price is uh, 68 for black menthol buyers uh, and uh, 99 cent for white menthol buyers. And if we evaluate uh, these numbers uh, uh, at the sample mean, uh, then tax burden for black buyers is lower uh, than uh, white buyers by about 8% of menthol cigarette price per pack. And one possible implication from this result is that uh, the lower rate of shifting for black menthol smokers would reduce uh, the regressiveness of cigarette taxes, uh, given that uh, blacks have uh, on average relatively lower income as well as the highest percentage of a menthol cigarette. So another important, important implication from the result is that increasing cigarette taxes would effectively reduce menthol smoking among blacks. Given the fact that the path-through rate for black menthol smokers is still uh, substantially above zero. All right, so this is gonna be the repetition of what I briefly said at the uh, beginning. So uh, the potential explanation for heterogeneity in path-through rates across race and product might be uh, as follows. So black menthol smokers may have uh, more price elastic demand than other uh, smokers. And on the supply side, uh, this may indicate that uh, cigarette manufacturers uh, offer more price discount to black menthol smokers than uh, other smokers. So we have some additional evidence about the racial disparities in tax shifting for menthol cigarettes. So we divide uh, the sample household by their location at the county level, depending on the share of a black population. So we have uh, you know, we have run uh, three different regressions, uh, panel A, B, C. So panel A uh, is a regression result for top uh, household located at top 10% of counties uh, in terms of the share of a black population. And panel B, top 20% of counties and top uh, panel C, top 50%. So the results show that the difference in pass-through rates between black and white menthol smokers is larger in counties with a large share of black population. Uh, note, however, that uh, these findings are, uh, I would say, just anecdotal because uh, you know, many counties are segre segregated by race. Uh, so even in a county with large black population, uh, some neighborhoods might have a uh, mostly white household. All right, so we also have some evidence that uh, black menthol smokers have a greater access to price discount, uh, and this uh, uh, support the potential explanation for our main result, as I uh, explained above. So in panel A, uh, first we measured price discount per pack, so this is the summary statistics for uh, price discount. So price discount is measured as the difference between the regular price and actual uh, paid price, uh, where the regular price is defined as the maximum uh, maximum paid price uh, within uh, each calendar month uh, for each five-digit uh, zip code area. So here we can see that uh, blacks receive or use more price discount for uh, than white smokers for menthol cigarettes, but this is not the case for a non-menthol product. And in panel B, we examine the correlation between price discount and ethnicity uh, with a simple uh, regression of a price discount uh, on demographic uh, variables, including uh, ethnicities. So uh, the result uh, show that uh, black household, black smokers, 
prices count is uh, uh, they receive prices count uh, uh, more than uh, other uh, more than the white the base group uh, of white uh, by about uh, seven cents, uh, which is uh, similar to the to what we see in the summary statistic in panel A, but this is not the case in non-metal product. Uh, the coefficient is even negative and it's uh, statistically not meaningful, uh, the magnitude. All right, so uh, to summarize, black menthol smokers receive or use more discount than white menthol smokers. Uh, but here we should note that the result do not include other types of pro uh, promotions such as multi-pack deals. So we use only a uh, price discount here. So for this reason, this may underestimate the price promotions available for uh, black menthol smokers. All right, so we test uh, the robustness of our main result to some alternative explanations for uh, the lower rate of tax shifting for black menthol smokers. So specifically, we consider uh, some uh, alternative factors, uh, not ethnicity, that could possibly generate our main result. So uh, we consider the following three, search for volume discount, search for quality, and uh, cross-state tax avoidance. So first, uh, the first is search for volume discount. If the tendency of a buying cigarettes by carton rather than by pack is predominant among Blacks, then this might explain the lower rate of shifting for Black menthol smokers. Uh, so the result show that the rate of shifting for black menthol smokers, uh, sorry, the result, uh, uh, the rate of shifting is uh, overall uh, lower for carton than uh, pack purchases. But uh, taxes are uh, still shifted at lower rates for black menthol smokers than white menthol smokers, uh, regardless of whether uh, it is uh, pack or carton purchases. So. The result suggests that a uh, search for volume discount is not a proper explanation for our result. And second, we uh, consider search for quality. So we consider quality difference uh, in terms of a premium and genetic brands. So, uh, you know, admittedly, there could be other, uh, you know, ways of uh, distinguishing uh, quality, product quality, but here we focus on uh, distinction between premium and genetic brands. So uh, black menthol smokers may be more likely to switch from premium to genetic cigarettes to compensate for price increases when they are faced by uh, tax increases. So our empirical, uh, uh, so the result show that uh, the rate of shifting are lower for genetic brands than uh, premium uh, menthol brands. So this is consistent with the previous findings. However, you know, what is important here is taxes are shifted at lower rates to black menthol smokers uh, than white menthol smokers for both premium and genetic product. So again, the result suggests that the search for quality is not the uh, driving force behind our main result. All right, the next one, the last alternative explanation that we consider is cross-state tax avoidance. So Harding et al. 2012, uh, in their paper, they find that the uh, rate of shifting can be lowered if cigarette buyers involve a cross-state tax avoidance. So if black menthol smokers are more likely to engage in uh, cross-state uh, tax avoidance, then the increased tax can be more shifted away uh, from black menthol smokers than from uh, other ethnic groups. So our robustness check for this uh, factor uh, follows the approach, uh, the same approach used by Harding et al. 2012. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, the Nielsen data provide information about the location of a household at the five digit G code level. So using this information, we calculated the shortest distance between a household and the nearest to lowest tax state border. So, uh, so there are two. Uh, so this is there are two important uh, 
variables here, text difference uh, and distance. So text difference is the difference in taxes between home state and the uh, nearest to lower tax state. And distance is the, it's the distance between household and the uh, uh, border to the nearest lower tax uh, state. And so we focus, we should focus on the coefficient estimate for tax difference and uh, the interaction term between tax difference and distance. So if tax difference, the coefficient of tax difference is uh, negative, then that implies cross-border purchasing lowers the rate of tax shifting. And if the coefficient for interaction between tax difference and distance is positive, then that indicate that a larger distance from the lower tax border reduces the opportunity for cross-state tax avoidance. So as you see, none of these coefficient estimates are statistically significant for uh, uh, blacks, right? So these two are not significant and the coefficient for interaction terms are not statistically significant either. So the results suggest that the cross-state tax avoidance is not the factor that generate our uh, main uh, result. All right, so I'm gonna finish my uh, presentation with some concluding remark and implications. So racial patterns of tax incidence for menthol cigarettes have important policy implications. Uh, given that black smokers have the highest percentage of menthol cigarette use and uh, they have been the main target of various marketing tactics for menthol products. So we used uh, Nielsen home skin data and find that uh, cigarette taxes are shifted at significantly lower rate to black menthol smokers. So for white menthol smokers, uh, it's uh, almost a full shifting, whereas uh, tax shifting is 68 cent per uh, $1 tax increase for black menthol smokers. And then we come up with some potential explanations uh, about uh, this result. And uh, we conjecture that black smoke menthol smokers are more responsive to cigarette prices. Uh, and then we find some indirect evidence about this by showing that uh, black smokers receive a significantly more price discount for menthol product. So our findings suggest that a uh, tax increase will re effectively reduce menthol smoking among blacks, uh, given that the path-through rate for black menthol smoker is still uh, above uh, zero, substantially above zero. Uh, but whether tax increases also reduce uh, racial disparities in menthol smoking between black and white, that will depend on the relative price uh, elasticity of demand between uh, black and white menthol smokers. Okay, thank you for uh, 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 listening to my talk uh, and uh, any comments or questions are welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have about six minutes left. Um, uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Lillard for discuss some comments. Okay, uh, just just a couple of uh, actual friendly suggestions. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting, careful work. Um, one thing that uh, I don't know if you've thought about, but you need to be careful in distinguishing. Uh, it's not true, or you don't, I think, this is a question, I think you don't have the evidence to say that Blacks receive more discount offers. What you have is you have evidence to say that Blacks redeem more discount offers. Um, and it's actually, I've done some work on this, and it's actually very difficult to get information on how many offers people actually get for uh, coupons and discounts. So it's it's not easy to measure that. And all the literature that you cite is actually citing what people are redeeming or they're doing censuses of in-store marketing, which is not the same thing as, as receiving. Okay, so that's a, just a, a, a side comment. The other thing that I'd like to suggest as an alternative explanation for your findings, and of course, it's for another paper, um, in the, all the analysis that you do where you split your sample and do side-by-side -side comparisons of the 
coefficient estimates for whites and blacks and non non white non blacks. Um, one of the things that strikes me that's a potential alternative explanation is um, there's a certain amount of correlation between all of your demographic characteristics that's being ignored by this model specification. The way you've specified the model, you eat, enter each of these demographic variables separately, and you're estimating, you know, holding these other things constant, but you're not allowing for things to be correlated. And especially, you know, I went to grad school on the south side of Chicago, so I watch this all the time. It's not simply that people are low income. It's that they're low income and there's a female headed family and they've got five kids in the, in the household and those things happen in combination. So a, a friendly suggestion that would be a very interesting follow up to this paper would be to do something like a principal or a either a principal component data reduction or a propensity score matching where you say, let's actually compare. So the story would be, if you look at Blacks, Blacks on average have lower income, have a higher incidence of female-headed households, have lower education. And if you look at those in combination, the suspicion, the nagging suspicion is that if I took a white in the same demographic group with the same combination of high unemployment, high female headed household, all that stuff, would they be just as cost conscious? Would they be shifting equally? And my suspicion is they would. You've got a very selected sample of blacks here. And so that's a cause for concern, but it's a, uh, it's a nice published paper. So you can follow up and say, can we explain this difference and make it go away. So that's just a friendly suggestion. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Lillard, for discussing comments. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A right now, um, but if uh, audience members have any questions, I know jo Joanne is going to mention this as well, um, there, feel free to join for uh, Top of the Tops after to continue this conversation with uh, microphone uh, and uh, video turned on. But I'm going to let Joanne for now take us out the door. Thank you. So we are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Kim, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. We will leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end, after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL which is bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 120 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend. <laughs>